professor from Ain Shams University. Uh, he is always interested in new technology, and he is vice president of the Egyptian Society of Neuroradiology. And I get every day five emails about new technologies. The last one was about 10 Tesla MRI images. His talk will be about current trends in functional neuro neuroimaging. Uh, thank you, Professor Rashad, for the kind introduction. And uh, when Professor Diasti, the head of the society, asked me to uh, talk about uh, function MR, so function MR encompasses a lot of things. And so pertaining to the uh, main topic of this conference, which is oncology, I uh, chose uh, to make this uh, outline about selected PET MR cases for brain tumors. And uh, PET MR, I consider it in the armamentarium of the overall functional uh, data. And also, I do uh, multiparametric data with it with spectroscopy, perfusion, diffusion, SWI, etc. And the second half would be pre surgical planning for brain tumors by functional MR and MR tractography. And if we have time, and I don't think we'll have time, I just will shed a very quick light on my latest uh, interest or hobby, which is using resting function MRI in neuropsychiatric disorders, which is, of course, not an oncologic entity. So with uh, PET-MR, as you know, it's a hybrid imaging. I don't want to go to details of uh, the physics and the technique and all this. I, I want to show you cases because I know everybody likes cases. So we'll start with this case, which came to us as a known case of high-grade uh, glioma and uh, after surgery and therapy. So it's pathologically proven high-grade glioma. And as Professor Yosri uh, said that uh, if it is IDH mutant, grade four, IDH mutant. If it is wild type, then this is the only one that you can call glioblastoma. Uh, so this was a uh, glioblastoma after uh, therapy, and as you see, the T1 post-contrast flare and diffusion images, and uh, these are giving you really a, a uh, like, I don't want to say nightmare, but it makes very difficult to distinguish where are any residual or recurrent tumor versus post-treatment uh, changes, because this is what the oncologists want to know. Uh, so we went for uh, t star perfusion, and we can see some hyperperfused zones that maybe give us an idea, but what about some parts which are also relatively hyperperfused, but not as much as these parts are? Do they have tumor? Yes, no. Uh, how can we tell? Uh, I went for uh, spectroscopy, but spectroscopy is limited in that you have the limitation of the voxel and the contamination from uh, normal brain parenchyma and post-therapy changes, but obviously we can see a high uh, choline peak suggesting that this part m might have a residual recurrent high-grade glioma. Uh, we did spectroscopy for another part in the case, but here you can see the choline is elevated, but not as the previous part of the lesion, and the n aspartate and creatine are not as much reduced so with spectroscopy and with perfusion, you get into certain difficulties. You are not totally sure. So we went for uh, PET-MR and the tracer that we have available in, in our country is gallium PCMA. Of course, uh, you all know about gallium PCMA from using it in prostate cancer, but we have been successful in using it for uh, high-grade brain tumors since the other uh, more applicable tracers like F-DOPA and FET are much expensive for uh, the uh, Egyptian patient. Uh, and here we can see that these hypermetabolic parts are all highly suggested to be of residual recurrent high-grade uh, glioma. So this is well showing you and uh, again is the background of uh, post-treatment uh, changes. So what's uptaken is the high grade and again also in the uh, going back to the axial images I showed you before. So we can pinpoint these parts 
whether for uh, guiding for biopsy, uh, rebiopsy, or for surgical uh, planning, or for radiotherapy planning, whatever. So we are highlighting what is high grade versus post-treatment changes. Uh, and again, another uh, also parts with high grade, the, most, the more hypermetabolic, and of course we measure the, SG, the uh, PSMA expression uh, versus the background, so we have qualitative and quantitative uh, data. Uh, for the next case, uh, it was originally a low-grade uh, astrocytoma that, uh, as uh, Dr. Yosri said, uh, we don't really use the term diffuse now, but just to... Uh, uh, the, the, the question was whether he is developing high-grade on uh, parts on top of the low-grade. This was the question sent by the oncologist. And uh, here are the images. You see this uh, diffuse uh, lesion in both cerebral hemispheres, uh, not enhancing. So obviously, uh, this is going with uh, the initial low-grade uh, potential. However, there appeared some small enhancing parts, as in this slide and in other parts. So do we have a high-grade transformation on top? And here, let me just emphasize what Professor Yosri said. Now. The grading can change, so you can have grade two or three that becomes grade four, okay? But the IDH status does not change. So if this was low grade, uh, uh, grade two, IDH mutant, even if it's upgraded, it remains also IDH mutant. So it does not change to wild type just because it has some high grade parts, okay? So this is very important to know. So wild type are, from the start, they are wild type, whether they are enhancing or not or whatever. And uh, we did also uh, uh, perfusion uh, studies, like t star perfusion here, which was not uh, that uh, convincing or conclusive, whether we have a high-grade transformation on top, and also spectroscopy, and you can see the difficulty with spectroscopy that you have a small enhancing nodule, but the voxel has contamination from surrounding normal brain parenchyma and maybe post-treatment changes. So even though the choline is high and the n partite is low, you can just say it is suggested that there is a high-grade tumor, but not totally conclusive. Uh, now we went for uh, FDG uh, PET, and FDG, the problem with this uh, tracer is that it is also uptaken by normal uh, brain parenchyma, as you can see in the cortex here. So you have uptaken the cortical regions. So what about these parts? They are nearly similar, if even not lesser than the normal cortex. So with FDG PET, the data is not totally conclusive. I said, let's, let's bring this patient again next day and do the gallium PSME. And with the gallium PSMA, now we have more definitive solid evidence that there are several parts of high-grade malignant transformation on top of the low grade. And because and the background is helping us that you are highlighting what's uptaking the tracer versus the background. Uh, so uh, the take-home message is that when you are dealing with high grade, the question of high grade, go for gallium PCMA, but better if you have it in any part of the world, go for one of the uh, fluorine tracers uh, for the uh, amon, uh, amino acid groups like FET, like FDOPA and others. Uh, another case, low grade astrocytoma, and here Fortunately, we could, or, or the patient could afford the F-DOPA, which is much more expensive than FDG. So here we have this uh, low-grade astrocytoma by all the scanning uh, uh, techniques. Uh, flare, diffusion, uh, just T2 shine through effect, very faint uh, enhancement, etc. Then when you use the F-DOPA, look at how there is high uptake in the parts that are having this uh, low-grade tumor because if these uh, amino acid tracers are so sensitive to uh, gliomas, even if they are low-grade, and we can also see that there is 
multi focal uh, spread down there in the infratentorial uh, aspects and so uh, this was we highlighted and pinpointed the parts that are of more aggressiveness for the neuro oncologist or for guiding biopsy uh, this is the case I was talking about, and so I didn't write primary or CNS lymphoma, but because, as uh, Professor Nicoletta said, that you have to have solid evidence that it is EB virus, I didn't have. So, uh, actually, to go to the case, this case was initially diagnosed as low grade astrocytoma and received combined therapy. and. Uh, Supratentorial structures, all the axial T1 post contrast, are actually not showing uh, great evidence of tumor, but the patient is highly symptomatic, maybe some small enhancing parts here. However, and again, this is the flare showing several zones of signal alterations. Now, when we went infratentorially, we can see several zones of intense enhancement that look to me like he has, he is developing lymphoma due to his immunocompromise after the chemo radiotherapy. And uh, FDG PET, uh, and here are, are the flare sequences going with them. Now using the FDG PET, we see this very remarkable high uptake. And so unlike the case I showed you with low grade astrocytoma, FDG is not doing a good job, but here there is remarkably high uptake of the tracer and not even in the brain, but also we find within the spinal canal. So we think that this is, we, I don't have pathological proof, but we think that this is uh, lymphoma on top of uh, the uh, treatment by, for the high grade because of this high uptake uh, of, the, of the FDG tracer, and of course, all of you know that uh, lymphomas are, uh, have high uptake by FDG in systemic lymphomas. Uh, this is the, the summary of what I've just said. Going to intracranial but extra-axial uh, tumor, so showing you another tracer, gallium dotatet now. So gallium dotatet is uptaken by uh, a lot of things. For you, those of you who do PET-CT, you know about the neuroendocrinal tumor in our arena and in neuroradiology, meningioma comes uh, on top of the list, pituitary adenomas and uh, some pineal body tumors, uh, etc. Now, the patient, sorry about that, the patient has breast cancer. So, for the neuro-oncologist, we are seeing a left cerebellopontine lesion. But uh, all of you will tell me well, look, it, it looks like a meningioma, so why did he send it to you where he was? He wanted to make that sure that it is meningioma and not a pachymeningeal metastatic deposit. This was his, or anything else, this was his question. So I told him, look, the thing uh, that I can help you with is to use gallium dotatet, and you can see that it has very high receptors for the dotatet, and this remarkably high uptake is kind of pathognomonic for being meningioma, not metastatic deposit. So uh, everybody was happy in this case. Uh, secondary brain tumors, uh, quickly, this is a known case of thymic carcinoma in 51-year-old male, and also who had chemo and radiotherapy, and now the conventional MR comes with this dural-based uh, extra-axial lesions that uh, are they post-treatment, uh, are they uh, pachymeningeal deposits, what's going on, uh, T1 pre, post, flare, and diffusion, also in the coronal views, and there was also a lesion at the skull base here on the right side. <laughs> Perfusion also was not that conclusive uh, maybe there is some hyperperfusion here, but usually this is difficult. Always it's difficult to do spectro and perfusion in skull base uh, lesions. Uh, T1 perfusion permeability also we have some uh, increased our hyperperfusion here. But when we use the PET-MR-FDG here, metastatic disease 
is strongly taking the tracer and we can for sure highlight for the neuro-oncologist the part, the metastatic parts and be very confident that these are actually metastases to help in his treatment planning. And also in the axial plane, the same uh, that, okay? Uh, another case of breast cancer uh, who had combined therapy and also gamma knife therapy and then we have this uh, big lesion infratentorially. So also uh, these enhancing lesions, uh, are they metastases, post-treatment effects, uh, vascular lesions, what's going on? And so also by perfusion was not that uh, conclusive uh, because of the, the necrotic part. So difficult to measure, uh, but when we do the PETMRFDG, actually we, uh, this left-sided lesion was the one that is for sure and typically having the highest uh, uh, FDG uptake. So this is the metastatic part and here mostly post-treatment uh, changes in this uh, part on the right side uh, with maybe some uh, mild uptake that you have to follow up, but for sure this has to be treated. And also in the coronal planes, the same uh, result. And we even did the whole body PETMR uh, FDG study, so we also highlighted lesions in the spinal canal. Now I want to, for those of you who are doing PET-CT, because I do PET-MRI mainly, I like MRI. The PET-CT people, and I don't want to, be, to criticize, they are not looking at the spinal canal. They only look at the bone marrow. Please use your PET to look within the spinal canal, especially for uh, breast cases, etc. Okay, because you can miss deposits within the spinal canal. Uh, I always tell my colleagues uh, about this, because I, I even have cases that I discover for them on, on reviewing the PET CT images that there actually were deposits within the spinal canal. Okay, moving to the second part about uh, function MR and MR tarcography, and I hope I just shed a light about the use of tracers in uh, neuro-oncology for primary tumors, for secondary one, uh, for extra axial, intra axial, and how you, you have to have this knowledge of which tracer to give in each case because these tracers are expensive and you want to uh, do the proper thing. So you have FDG, you have PSMA, you have amino acid tracers, you have dot a tet, uh, etc. Now, for functional MR, what you want to comment quickly is the distance of the tumor to eloquent brain areas. Uh, and uh, this is an arbitrary uh, classification. Maybe Professor Yusri would like to comment upon it, but uh, people usually say zero distance if there is abutment or displacement less than two centimeters from the tumor, more than two centimeters from the tumor. And uh, what are the eloquent areas that we look for? And of course, according to the location of the tumor, but usually for motor, we want to highlight hand, foot, tongue. Tongue and lips are one entity together. Language, Broca's vernix exner. Broca's is the receptive language area versus, uh, Broca's is the expressive language area at inferior frontal gyrus. Vernix, the receptive language area at superior temporal gyrus and angular and supramarginal gyri. And exner at the middle frontal gyrus does, has to do with high uh, end uh, language post processing. Less common requests by the clinician's memory. Uh, especially at the hypocompa regions for episodic long-term and long-term memory, visual, medial, lateral, and superior parts, auditory, attachal, gyrus. So these are the more common, these are the less common, and also depends on the location of the tumor. Uh, so let's start. I have two cases, uh, and I always do functional and tractography combined. Even if they ask me for functional, I do tractography. If they ask me for tractography, I do functional, because these are interconnected. The, f the functional areas are like the houses or the places and the tra tracks are like the streets. So we have to give the whole map, okay? So we have a 21 year old with right frontal intraaxial space occupying uh, lesion, as you can see here. And as uh, the very eloquent lecture by Professor Yosri, you have uh, what 
to me appears a T2 mismatch uh, sign, so it can be an astrocytoma. Uh, I don't see the high rim at the periphery, so still, well, uh, I'm doing functional and they send it to me as pathologically proven low-grade astrocytoma, so I'm, or, uh, or starting to be uh, low-grade astrocytoma, but still can be oligodendroglioma, and you have to go back to prov Professor Yusri lecture about it. So it's a low-grade tumor, IDH mutant, whether astro or oligo. Okay. Now, uh, concentrating on what I was requested, so here uh, we did the functional test for the left hand, and the left hand is located at the lateral part of the uh, right precentral gyrus, and looking at Professor Yostri, actually he was the guy who wrote all these uh, things many years ago. So uh, at the hand knob area, uh, and the, you can see there is zero distance between the tumor and the hand uh, area. And here in the coronal plane, this is the hand area, this is the tumor. And then on the sagittal plane, and you can see that there is zero distance. So you give this valuable information to the neurosurgeon to plan his uh, surgery for uh, the foot and the supplementary motor area together. The foot is at the deep part of the right precentral gyrus. This is for the left foot. This is the supplementary motor area. And here another uh, plane. And also similarly here the foot area, the supplementary motor area and the relation to the tumor may be uh, 0 0.5 centimeter or something. And also in the sagittal plane, this is the left foot uh, area and this is in another in the subsequent uh, plane to show its uh, relation to the most uh, medial part of the tumor. Uh, this is the supplementary motor area uh, at the posterior part of the right uh, frontal loop in a powerful sign location. For the tongue at the infralateral aspects of the frontal lobes along the inferior parts of the precentral gyri, uh, we have bilateral representation usually. There is larger representation on the left side compared to the right side, maybe because of the effect of the tumor, which is abutting this area of representation, or there is very small distance in between, as we can see here. Uh, okay, now because of the location of the tumor, we also did language paradigm. Here are all language areas. So here is uh, left brocus, left inferior frontal gyrus, left. Uh, sorry about the left vernix at left superior temporal gyrus and continuous parietally. Their homologues on the right side l are likely larger representation of left language areas compared to the right, which can suggest left language dominance bilaterality index, which is the contralateral side of the tumor. We go higher up for axinar areas at the middle frontal gyri. This is on the left side. This is on the right side. So the nearest to the tumor is actually right homologue of uh, axinar, while uh, right homologues of Brocus and Vernix are below level of tumor, and we can measure these uh, distances easily. And another view for the relation of the tumor to axinar uh, area on the right side, and also on coronal uh, plane. And on uh, sagittal, here we can see Exner and we can see Brocus, and also other uh, views for the language areas. Here are the language areas, uh, also uh, Brocus and Vernix, Vernix on the sagittal views. So you give all this information, and they uh, also uh, put that on their uh, navigator or if. Some advanced centers even have intraoperative functional MRI uh, helping them in the, these uh, surgeries. And uh, here on, on the coronal planes, so actually Broca's area is below the tumor. Uh, and also in another view, uh, vernix areas are below and also posterior to the tumor. And then, as I said, tractography, we have projection of fibers, most important, corticospinal tracts and Myers loop, and uh, commissural corpus callosum association, most other large tracts like the singlum, IOFF, ILF, frontoacellan tract, etc. Corticospinal tract and the relation to uh, the tumor. Uh, so uh, maybe for the sake of time, just uh, this tumor is uh, very intimately related to the right corticospinal tract 
and uh, Myers loop are below it and uh, uh, here are the callosal fibers uh, cingulum a little bit further from the tumor uh, arcuit fasciculi connecting vernus and brocus below level of tumor uh, ancillate fasciculi lower down the ventral language pathway and in IOFF also below level of tumor in connecting occipital and frontal lobes inferior lucternal fasciculus connecting occipital with temporal lobes and the lastly frontoacellant tract which is actually the most intimate to the tumor because it connects middle and superior uh, frontal language areas and with parietal lobes and this is uh, one of the very eloquent tracts okay and this is the quantitative assessment uh, the more the tract is affected the more there is reduced fraction isotropy which is directionality of diffusion and abnormally high ADC which is the magnitude of diffusion now to uh, finish up let me go to the uh, last case because this actually was a uh, left uh, temporal high-grade glioma and uh, so for this we do not do motor we do language and memory because it's lower down temporally and uh, so with the functional we have the visual areas and we can assess their religion relation to the tumor the visual we can get for free du during doing the language actually you don't have to do a separate uh, paradigm so language areas and the relation to the tumor uh, in this slide language and visual so again brocas vernix uh, on the contralateral side homolog of brocas and the visuals uh, here uh, brocas on the right side and uh, then uh, brocas areas on coronal views and the relation to the tumor actually abutted by it uh, by the superior aspect of the tumor so the most vulnerable is uh, uh, left the Broca's area in this case while vernix area are posterior to the tumor uh, in the various exner are just above the tumor and here are Broca's vernix and exner together uh, and the tumor is over here and then last but not least the memory uh, memory is very difficult because there are so many types of memory but for episodic memory at the hippocampal formations here are memory representations bilaterally also abutted by the tumor and nearly equivocal uh, representation here in the axial view on the coronal and see how the tumor is affecting it and on the sagittal uh, very much intimate to the tumor and uh, this has uh, to be uh, very taken good care of going to tractography now the high tracts are uh, not in the pathway of the tumor like corticospinal but Myers loop is very much uh, affected by the tumor and displaced and deviated and this is an important loop because it's the lateral most part of the optic radiation very important surgically because if injured during surgery it can cause visual field defect so the surgeon must take very good care of Myers loop and its location to the tumor higher uh, tracks as i said callosal cingulum are all above level of uh, tumor uh, arcuate but ancillate fasciculi is actually passing within the tumor likely infiltrated by it and this is uh, the ventral language pathway connecting inferior frontal and temporal language areas uh, and uh, also inferior occipitofrontal fasciculus but more so the inferior tendinal fasciculus connecting occipital and temporal lobes deviated by the tumor and attenuated by it frontoacellant tract above level of tumor and then the table we mentioned and uh, the summary of what I give them and I also give them uh, 3D time of flight MRE data to account for the vascular uh, relations to this uh, tumor uh, resting function just one minute uh, I have we've been using it in pediatrics like cases of ADHD autism epilepsy adults depression, anxiety, OCD, bipolar, schizophrenia, elderly, dementia, depression, anxiety. And this is a completely different talk and lecture, but uh, I, I hope I can tell you about it in another setting, but just to make, to, to give you the most recent advances in uh, neuroimaging that now I, I have referrals from psychiatrists. I have referrals from psychiatrists and I, I, I wish to thank uh, Dr. Max Windmark who is the currently 
the new editor of chief of Asia in R because his lecture was inspiration for me. It's what, like two years ago during ASNR meeting, his lecture was inspiration for me to go into the resting functional for psychiatric disease. And by this, I thank you all very much.